Hey, it's John from Tinderbox Arts. So I'm gonna do a little quick video here about battery chargers because it comes up in the forums all the time and people really are spewing a lot of ignorance and I wanna to try to clear up some of the confusion. So here where I am, winter time often means you got a bike under a cover. This is a Triumph underneath there, a Triumph Bonneville. And uh, you know, I got my son has his bike and I have my, my RT, which I do ride the winter time, but once we get salt and snow on the roads, you know, that's about the end of it. So inevitably there's going to be downtime and you should have your bike on a charger during that downtime. But there's a lot of confusion about how these things work and I want to try to clear that up if I can. So check it out. Here is a modern smart charger. It's not an expensive one. It's a cheap one actually. But this one is a big unit. has all sorts of doodads on it and you can change uh, how it gets charged and has a reconditioning which may or may not work. I'm honestly not even too sure. This particular one I have on my... Um, my Jeep, it's an automotive application. But this is an example of a big charger, which um, you know is usually overkill for a motorcycle, but I just want to show you know some of the range that's available. So that's one of them. Now this little charger uh, is more, more uh, like what most people have on a motorcycle. It's small, it doesn't really have much on the front. Basically you plug it in and it does its work. But there's something really important to understand about this, which is it's a smart charger. And by that term, what I mean is it's got a microprocessor in there. It's got firmware and software programming in there that allows it to monitor the battery charge and change what it's doing depending on what it sees on the monitor. Let me show you up close about something else. Here's an extreme close-up. Microprocessor controlled. Anytime you buy a charger, and in the modern world you really don't have too much choice these days, you want to see something like this. Look, here's another example. Uh, this one's made by Schumacher. Again, it's microprocessor control. This one's quite old. It's probably 20 years old. But I'll give you a close-up. Again, microprocessor controlled. It has auto voltage, they called it, but whatever. You want to see that it's microprocessor controlled. Here's another example. Uh, this one actually was run over by a car, <laughs> but it still works. Um, and I have this one connected to a, a lawnmower. Um, and again, it's microprocessor controlled. Now, here's a different example. This one is a simple trickle charger. Um, and this one is not microprocessor controlled and it, it works very differently. In this unit you have what I call a wall wart. So that just plugs into the wall. You have just a little transformer here. And in this case it has these uh, you know, clamps on it, but it doesn't really matter what's on the end. The important point is it's just a transformer. So this puts out a constant voltage uh, that's why they call it a trickle charge. Um, sometimes they'll call it a battery maintainer or a float charger, but the common term is trickle charge. And this is different because it puts out that, that straight voltage. It doesn't monitor the battery at all. And plausibly, you could overcharge a battery by keeping this on all the time. However, in practice, um, this puts out so little voltage that it's unlikely that you're going to overcharge your battery. But it's possible. Now, with a microprocessor controlled charger, a smart charger, it's not possible to overcharge. This thing will, will uh, monitor the battery and you could just leave this connected. There's no reason to disconnect this. It's doing its job. Just leave it connected, let it monitor the battery and it'll offer a charge when it needs it and turn it off when it doesn't. Now you need to connect the charger to the battery somehow, right? So here in my, uh, my lawnmower, I just have the alligator clamps which works fine and that works for automotive applications too. But for a motorcycle, you want to be able to hook up quickly and not have to take the seat off or whatever to get at the battery. So we use a different method. Now my BMW friends, uh, will, especially the ones in Europe, will talk about uh, various ports that BMW provides uh, which can be used for different things, for heating, you know, for your heated gloves or heated gear. Um, but you can also buy chargers that hook up to some of these ports and you know, just plug right in and off you go. Those need to be compatible with what's called CAN bus, which is a special uh, networked uh, electrical system uh, that BMW and other bike manufacturers and car manufacturers use as well. Um, but I don't think that's the best way to go uh, for a number of reasons. One is uh, I think it's preferable to connect directly to the battery and avoid that system altogether. So if there's any problem with that system, you know, you're still going to get a charge. So um, let me show you how I connect and how I prefer to connect to bikes. 
All right, all of my bikes have this connector, and it's usually located somewhere, you know, down low where it's easy to reach. And um, it's generally called an SAE pigtail. You may have different names for it, but if you buy a battery maintainer, a smart charger, whatever you want to call it, um, it's going to come usually with this connector and this one as well if you're buying it new. One beauty about this connector is that you can't hook it up wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's got a, you know, a positive and negative side and it only fits one way. So on the bike, you have this connector and you just leave it. And they do give you a little cap here, right? So when you're not using it for charging, you just put that little cap on and it's protected. I've never had a problem. This is very commonly used, at least in the States. Now, if you follow that wire up, it's generally, I think it's always connected directly to the battery terminal. So you'll have, you know, the battery connection for the bike and you'll have a battery connection for the charger. And that's always sitting there. So it's a direct connect. Um, you're going to have less problems as far as uh, corrosion and that kind of thing. Because if you're trying to go through the CAN bus system, there's all sorts of other wiring that electricity has to go in order to charge the battery. And it has to work with the network. So instead, this is directly connected to the batteries and you're not going to have any problems uh, as far as that. And it's a, the cable itself is a, a thicker gauge and you can use this for other things as well. So, you know, sometimes people do use this for connecting heated gear or, um, you know, all sorts of things. They, they make all sorts of accessories. So it's an option to have. But here in the States anyway, this is very commonly used. So look, the point of this video is if you get a charger, it should be a smart charger, microprocessor controlled, and that way it's monitoring the battery and you're not going to have any issues. You should leave it connected and it'll do its job and in the springtime or whenever it is you come back to your bike you're gonna have a battery that's in good shape so please no more posts about you know leaving a charger on there being a problem or anything like that it isn't a problem as long as you have a smart charger if you have a trickle charger that may be a different thing but honestly you should probably upgrade into something more modern